Um, uh, so it's, a, it's great to have my bride at my side, and I am going to open this up. So let's start with a, uh, a uh, call to worship as a prayer. Father, we thank you for the blessings and the opportunity to be here today. May your hand of mercy and grace be upon us as we seek to worship and glorify the God of the universe, the one who loves us and sent Jesus Christ to die for us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> If you're a visitor with us this morning, we'd ask you to look. Can you hear me? Okay. Look in the pew back and fill out one of these visitor's cards, please, and put it in the offering plate. We'd like to have a record of your visit with us. 
tonight at 6 o'clock, we will be doing I Sing, You Sing, We All Sing for Ice Cream. It's going to be modified a little bit because Shelly has COVID, won't be here, but we will still be having this and doing the singing for an hour and have ice cream. There will be lots of ice cream, lots of good ice cream. Uh, ministry volunteers are needed. The deacon-led bereavement team is looking for team members who are willing to minister to members of our church family. If you're interested, please contact Ellen Anderson. And a reminder, the Stewardship Counting Subcommittee requests that you please be sure to write your name, envelope number, your amount of offering on your envelope to ensure posting to your account for your annual contribution statement. If you need envelopes, please contact the church office. And last but uh, certainly not least, Beth, we want to remember Bethany Lawson, whose mother passed away this week, Patricia Edmondson. Join me now as we go to prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many blessings you have given us to this nation, to this country. We ask your blessing on this, continued blessing on this nation. We ask the blessing on the leaders of this nation. Regardless of party affiliation, we ask that they do what's right for this country. We bless this church and the members of this body, that they may spread the gospel. We, bl we want to also remember our community, that we may go out in that community and win souls to Christ. Now as we go forth throughout this week, may we take the gospel with us. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Uh, hopefully you have already been looking at the slides that have been shown on the screen for the, from the mission trip, and you see some of the backdrop for our BBS, and some of the decorations that we had. And I just want to say thank you to you who uh, prayed for us on the mission trip, um, those of you who, who gave cards, and, and especially those of you who gave in your offering to make it possible for us to be able to go. Um, so what, uh, what you're about to hear, you're going to be hearing from Judy Inscore and Pat Morgan, um, their experiences on the trip. And what you're about to hear is just a small portion of how God brought together 26 people from four churches, to some of which those people never had never met each other until Sunday afternoon when we got there, and, and how, the, how God brought them together uh, to, to do some amazing things things uh, and how he used us to accomplish more than we could have ever accomplished in our own strength. Um, the stories they tell are going to be just a very few stories of the things that took place on the mission trip, so I would encourage you to have conversations with those who went because uh, everyone had really good experiences and would love to be able to share, share them with you. So uh, Judy is going to come first and then Pat will come after that. Good morning. Um, as Tim said, you see some of the backdrop here in the picture. So um, just a, a little reflection um, down memory lane for us, but to let you all see, you know, part of just a small portion of what we did. But uh, I'm going to repeat what Tim said. Thank you so much for your prayers, for your encouragement, for your support. Uh, it, it certainly throughout the week as we read cards and got texts and talked with people, uh, it, it was so wonderful to be remembered and lifted up in prayer. So thank you. Um, but as Tim said, four churches coming together. Um, some were veterans of mission trips, some were new. Uh, so it was a, a combination where we could share with one another just the past experiences. But as uh, we often heard on the trip, every mission trip is different. Um, sometimes unplanned things come up too. So it's uh, one of the first things that uh, Tammy and Richard, who uh, are camp, the, over the, the mission camp direct, director, said, be flexible. Always have to be flexible. So we kept that in mind. But as far as the, uh, the Vacation Bible School and some uh, other uh, outings we did, I'll, I'll just report on those. Uh, for Vacation Bible School, the first thing, I guess, for, for many of us is we, we prepared here. We had the, 
children here, uh, and we're preparing for more down in the area, according to what we had been told ahead of time. We did have a small turnout, averaged about 16 a night, but we just thought, you know, it's small, but yet they're so enthusiastic and they were so interested and it was just a lot of fun. So uh, we had almost one-on-one -on -one with them because there were so many of us volunteering and some that came from the churches to help. But it was a, a fun time of making waves, of reaching out, and that's what we talked with them about, that you, God made you for a purpose, to reach out and to, um, you know, share the word, share the message, and affect others. So for Vacation Bible School, as I said, it was um, it was always, you know, just fun to work with the children and, and share the, the message with them. Another thing we did was our um, goodie baskets we made for our first responders. We had several uh, fire departments and sheriff, de sheriff departments locally that we went out to. Uh, took the baskets, met with them, of course had some pictures. But I guess the main thing with that is just the encouragement and thanks we wanted to give to them. So often they don't get that or even worse, um, you know, looked at in a negative way often. So we just wanted to share how appreciative we were with them, for them for the work that they did, putting their lives on the line for the community. Uh, and again, they were just so appreciative, very overwhelmed with what amount we presented to them. Uh, we then provided what we called operational support uh, to the facility itself, which included cleaning. Uh, they do have regular cleaning crews from churches that come in, but we, um, we stepped in and did that, and I just looked at, you know, as they said, giving them a break for the week. So we did the, the cleaning of the facility. There were other groups there as well from other churches, from other locations, and it was just, a, a, you know, a time of, of cleaning all the areas uh, each day, just so it would be comfortable and, and pleasant to, to, you know, work in each day. Uh, the other piece was um, with their food pantry, did some bagging of items, uh, sorting of items so that they could be presented at the uh, at the food pantry. We we didn't directly work in the food pantry handing out anything, but it was preparing some of the supplies and the food for that as well. Um, so to recap, for me overall, as as the week, the activities went on. I just the main thing with, that I thought of were, were his servants. Were they serving in whatever it might look like in whatever way we're serving? And we're doing his work and just doing it with joy and uh, wanting to share that, uh, the message with the others. So it's just being the faithful servants, not only there, but each and every day um, doing his work. So thank you. Good morning. Uh, I have had the opportunity to serve on mission trips in the past, but it's been quite a while since I've been on one. Um, and health issues had made it kind of impossible to do it in the last few years. But because of the, my improved health, um, I've been able to serve with the, some of the men of the church and uh, uh, working on a couple of handicap ramps. And uh, Tim and Max invited me to uh, come on this year's mission trip and uh, thought for a while it might not be possible due to a, uh, a scheduling conflict, but uh, that was worked out where I could go and be there for part of the week. I was there from Sunday to Wednesday, and, and, and in all honesty, based on the heat and everything and, and my age and my knees, um, you know, about three days of work was about what, you know, I was capable of doing at this point in time. Uh, I work with the construction crew, and first of all, let me say, I am not a carpenter, but this church is blessed to have some folks who have a lot of skill and knowledge, and uh, uh, the house we were working on, a lot was accomplished during the week. Uh, the gentleman's house had burned, and they are rebuilding uh, his house there. 
and uh, a lot has been accomplished, and a lot was accomplished this week by by our group, and uh, also the gentleman who heads things up there at the Charity uh, Mission Center. Um, and again, like I say, I was I was a step and fetch type person basically, um, but you know. I feel like because of my past health issues, I was able to go this past uh, on this mission trip based on the grace of God. He He gave me the opportunity to uh, to go and serve. And uh, Ephesians two eight through ten speaks about God's grace, uh, not only about His saving grace, but I think His grace that. Uh, chooses ahead of time the works he prepares the works for us and uh, you know I just feel like it's part of God's grace that I was able to be a part of this I was probably one of the uh, may have been the oldest person from the uh, the Highland group um, and based on my age I have some experiences I have experiences in making excuses I have excuse. I have experiences in saying, "Well, wait till next year. I'll do it. I'll do it down the road." But um, the Bible's very clear. We're not promised tomorrow. Uh, most Proverbs and James it says that we're not. We're not promised tomorrow. So, based on that fact that we're not promised tomorrow, I would encourage everyone, young and old, to. Uh, to say yes to the opportunities that God provides us to serve. It may not be a mission trip. It may be at the uh, Community of Hope. It may, you know, there are various ways to serve. So I would encourage you to, to say yes to those opportunities regardless of age. Now the gentleman that uh, we were working on his house, Mr. Paul, Mr. Paul, said on many times that he'd been blessed every day since his house burned by the people who came and uh, had been helping him. And uh, so he said he'd been blessed. But in Acts 20, 35, Jesus is quoted by Paul as saying, it's, uh, it's more blessed to give than receive. So Mr. Paul, he was the receiver there, and he's being blessed. So I would say, based on that scripture, that each and every one of us who went on that mission trip would, would say, we were blessed. We were blessed by being able to go on that trip. And um, one of the blessings that I feel like I received from the trip was the opportunity to uh, develop relationships to work alongside two of my Sunday school teachers where you know, you're getting a different perspective than what you get on Sunday morning. When you're working, when it's hot, you're uh, dirty, sweaty, you see people as they really are a little more than you do on Sunday morning. So that, that I think is definitely a, a blessing. Also to be able to work with uh, with Pastor Frank. You get to see him in a different perspective as well. And to meet new people, not only people from Highland, but people from other churches as well, and get to share in some of their experiences and their, their faith journey as well. So I feel like I was blessed by all of these opportunities, an opportunity again that I would say was based on the grace of God. And I'm just appreciative of the opportunity of going and, and serving. Thank you. Okay, I will try this a third time. Uh, please uh, stand with us while we're singing. What a beautiful name it is.
Our scripture today is taken from four books in the New Testament, Matthew, John, Acts, and 1 Corinthians. And the, and the uh, words will be up on the board and you can follow along. Matthew 3, 16 to 17. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. John 1, 1 to 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Acts 5, 3 and 4. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. And from 1 Corinthians 12, 4 and 5, Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit and the are there and varieties of service but the same Lord and there are varieties of activities but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone 
May God add his blessing to the reading of this word. for the offertory prayers we get started. Father, thank you for these your words that you have written for us to uh, honor you, to learn from you, to try to understand a little more about you. Father, we pray your blessings now on the gift and the giver as we collect the offering. And Lord, as we then uh, use this offering for your kingdom and for your glory and to spread the gospel in Jesus' name, amen.
Anybody here understand God? <laughs> Wait a minute. Come on. Anybody here understand the Trinity? You do. You can fully explain it. You know, there's, there's a lot about the God that we worship that we can't understand. And there are some aspects of who he is and how he presented himself and presents himself to us um, to even to this day and will forever. But there are other things that we just can't fully grasp. Our mind is finite. Our mind is limited. And, and while we can explain certain aspects of what we believe, it is very difficult to explain it all. I don't like to use a lot of different scriptures, if you hadn't figured that out yet. But there's no one scripture that fully explains the Trinity. So I've had to use several. There is a, a creative tension, if you will, in understanding the three persons of God in one. And as one uh, writer called it, he's God in his three-in-oneness. Three-in-oneness. Which maybe makes a little more sense than Trinity, but I, I, I don't know uh, specifically. We have possible images of that. Three-in-one. Some have suggested that, oh, you have a person like myself, or if you are a female, you can parallel it. I am a father. I am a husband. And I am, was a son to my parents. I guess I always will be, but they passed away many years ago. But the very, very significant difference is that while those are three different roles, it's still just me. Right? So, so that's very limited. We can understand, okay, I, I'm a father. I take care of my family. I, I'm a husband. Take care of her. I'm a, I'm a son. Uh, all those sorts of things. But it's, it's roles and not three different persons, just one person. There are many other illustrations that were given, and I found many of them. I'm not going to go through and, and detail those. There are some impact, or there is an impact of the Trinity on relationships, which I'll get to at the end and how that should impact us. The one illustration that comes about as close as my little pea brain can understand is water. You can, according to science, theoretically have in one state, if you have a closed environment, if the temperature is right and the pressure is right, you can have ice, water, and steam all at the same time. Now, I don't know if that helps any or not because that's an, not a natural form of water. But God is naturally and eternity, eternally three in one. Um, one of the odd things about um, the three in one understanding or the triune understanding is that, that many people try to explain it in different ways and many religions actually look at us and go, y'all are nuts. Or, like the Muslims, we worked in Indonesia for 10 years, and the Muslims believe there, that we worship three gods. Three gods, not one god with three persons, but three gods. And those three gods are God the Father, God the Son, and Mary the Mother. Literally, for the Muslim, that's what they think. God the Father, God the Son, and Mary the Mother. Not God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which is very different. Um, but that's what they believe. Now, I'll get into a few basic concepts that we will come to understand, but I, I've used a, both my notes from systematic theology way back in books about that thick to try to figure this thing out at least a little better to explain. And one of those writers, Millard J. Erickson, wrote this in his attempt to explain the Trinity. He said, if you try to explain it, you'll lose your mind. But if you try to deny it, you'll lose your soul. Let me say that again. If you try to explain it, you'll lose your mind. But if you try to deny it, you'll lose your soul. It's a very 
important aspect of theology for us as believers. Now, now, what's the difference? What does it really matter if it's really three and one or one God in different modes and all those sorts of things, which throughout history there have been uh, heresies, false teachings, that would say there are three different gods. One of those heresies, which has surfaced again with a very popular uh, preacher these days, is called modal, modalism. God presented himself in three different modes. That's not that hard to understand. Almost like father, son, and husband, he was creator God until Jesus, then he was Jesus, and now he's Holy Spirit. So it's not one God in three persons eternally, but one God who manifests himself in three different modes. That's not what the Bible teaches. And I'll show you through scripture. Um, but here are a few important reasons why uh, we need to at least try to understand and certainly must believe in the Trinity. If Jesus, for example, is not fully God, <laughs> then can he really save us? Can a human being who God may have specially adopted or anointed or put forward or Holy Spirit on him, if, if Jesus was only a human, could he really save us? Isn't that God's work? Of course it is. So that's an important aspect of it. If Jesus is not infinite, in other words, eternal and limitless, then why should we pray to him or worship him? He's not really God. He's, again, just kind of a guy that was special. Another aspect, <clears throat> um, if, if um, someone teaches that Christ was a created being, but nonetheless one who saved us, then this teaching is wrong and attributes credit for salvation to a creator and not to God himself. So again, we're getting into the, to the weeds a little bit, but there's a lot of, a lot of different ideas. Here's one more, just one more. If there is no trinity, then there is no interpersonal relationships within God, and therefore <clears throat> there cannot truly be relationships between God and others. I know this is getting a little bit ethereal, a little bit detailed, but the bottom line is if we do not believe that God is the same God who created and who came to earth and died and who fills us and dwells within us, then we're missing what the scriptures are saying and we're missing the importance of all that there is. So let me focus on three basic aspects. I won't get into <clears throat> all kinds of things, but three basic aspects that tell us that God is three in one. God is three persons. That's the best term. Uh, the Greek is something a little different, but that's the best term that throughout history, English has used is three persons, or even three distinct persons. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Each person is fully God. Okay? So far, that's not too hard. However, if you stop there, it's easy to go, oh, well, there's just three gods, like some of the other religions. Y'all are glazed over. Are you following me? <laughs> so if there, are, if, there, if, if there are three distinct persons and they're all fully God, then you've got three gods so far. But that's not all the Bible says. The Bible says God is one. And that's where we differ from any polytheism like the Greeks and the Romans had or the Hindus still have to this day. God is one. <clears throat> and yet he's more than one. Just as an example, you don't have to turn, but if you remember vaguely in the creation uh, in Genesis 1, 26, God says, let us make man in our image. That's interesting. Who's God talking to? Himself. Let us make man in our image. And actually, the, the, the word for God, Elohim, some of you have heard that, is plural. And actually, the word for Lord is plural, Adonai. 
When Isaiah was called, you might remember the, uh, the, the picture of Isaiah being called. He sees this incredible experience, uh, excuse me, he sees this incredible vision of the temple of God with God in it and, and just the, the train of his robe just fills the place. And, 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 and God says, who shall I send who will go for us? Who will go for us? Isaiah 6, 8. An interesting singular and plural in there. So in a sense, you could say, God is they. Any English teachers in here? <laughs> don't, don't, don't get into that with, with all the pronouns going on. Or you could say, God are him. Because he's more than one, and yet he's one. Very, very challenging. But here's the three points again. God is three distinct persons, each fully God, and there's only one God. Let's look at a couple of scriptures just to help clarify that. Back to Matthew 3. Matthew 3, 16 and 17. You, you probably read this a bunch. You've heard this a bunch. It's one of the reasons that a lot of churches give for a baptism by immersion fully under the water and rising up because Jesus was baptized. And immediately he went up from the water, Jesus. And yet, behold, the heavens were opened to him, and what happened? And the heavens were opened up to him, and what happened? I've got it right here too, but... And, and right, the heavens were opened to him and he saw the Spirit of God descending on him like a dove and coming to rest on him. And so there's the Holy Spirit. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my Son with whom I am well pleased. So all in one experience, in one moment, if you will, all three being manifested at once, that's why you can't have these three modes of God appearing, right? Because God's speaking, sending the Holy Spirit, and Jesus is there in the picture. It's very clear, very distinct. There are other places that you can see the distinctiveness, if you want to write some of these down, those of you who, who like to do that in Colossians chapter 1, 16 through 20 is, an, is, is a little bit more of a description of how Christ, Jesus, participated in the uh, creation and how he is the um, image. Jesus was physical, right? He is the image of the invisible God. And if that rings a bell, you can, you can look in John 14 through 17, those four chapters, four, 50, 60, yeah, those four chapters, and you can see how Jesus talks about, I and the Father are one, and uh, I've, I, the, we're going to send the Holy Spirit, and, and those sorts of things. So, <clears throat> so it's very clear that there are distinct persons, distinct persons beings, again, for a, a lack of, one, of a good word. Each one is fully God. Well, that one comes from multiple passages, also from Colossians, as I read, but also from 1 John chapter 1. You know this passage, at least part of it. <clears throat> I'll get to a verse that we don't have up here. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was God, with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Who was the Word? Jesus. Verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That was Jesus. So in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And yet the word was God. And all things were made through him, and without him was nothing, was not anything made that was made. So somehow God created, and yet he created through Jesus Christ. You see the challenge of explaining all this? Distinct, and yet one working together for the common, common good. 
For us to say each is fully God, I think we can all agree we think of God, maybe God the Father. Sometimes we see a, an older man with a, with a white beard, you know, sitting on a throne. I don't know about you, but sometimes that still pops into my head when I think of God. And then we can think of Jesus fairly clearly um, as distinct because he lived on this earth. But he is not just fully God. He is God himself. And then the Holy Spirit is also fully God. Let's look at Acts chapter 5. And I don't want to belabor this. We, we, we're just going to try and touch on this a little bit. But um, in Acts chapter 5, listen to this. Peter, so let me, let me tell you what's happening. In the church, people are selling what they own. Houses and fields and stuff. And, and they bring the the proceeds together to the apostles, the end of chapter 4, and they distribute to everyone as has need. Well, uh, at the end of chapter 4, Barnabas does that, and, and he's praised for that at the end of chapter 4. And, and so other people are trying to do something similar and do something great. And so Ananias and his wife Sapphira go and sell a field. Right? Hey, that's great. But they decide, well, we're going to hold back a little bit just in case we need it, and we'll give this much. Maybe it was 50%, maybe it was 70%, maybe it was 90%, who knows. But they evidently told Peter and the others there that here's what we got for it. <clears throat> and Peter says to Ananias, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to whom? To the Holy Spirit and to keep back part for yourself of the proceeds of the land. While it remained unsold, did it not remain yours, your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart, in other words, to hold back some and yet say it is on, You've not lied to man, but to God. Now, who did he lie to a couple of verses ago? The Holy Spirit. One and the same, and yet different. But again, if we stop here, it's easy. We got three gods. But we don't have three gods. And, and there are many verses that that show that the first one comes from Deuteronomy. We don't have it up there. We'll read from 1 Corinthians in just a minute. But in, in, in Deuteronomy chapter 5, God through Moses gives the Ten Commandments. And then at the beginning of chapter 6, he says this, which was an incredibly important verse for Israel for all of their life. They would roll it up and put it in a thing by the door. Do you know what that thing by the door was? mezuzah. You've heard of that before. If you've ever gone in a, actually some Christians actually have a little thing on the door. But they would wrap it up and it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. So that's the foundation of teaching about God. There is one God, and you shall not worship any other gods beside me. You shall not take my name in vain, and you shall honor me uh, in all kinds of ways, but especially through the Sabbath. And so that's what he says here. But listen to this. This is a little different take, because this is post-Jesus, when uh, on earth, that is, his de past his death and resurrection. And we find these words in 1 Corinthians 12. Now, Pay attention to the words. There are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. Who's that? Jesus. And there are varieties of activities, but the same God who empowers them all and everyone. Now he's getting ready to talk about the spiritual gifts. But it's God, Father, God Almighty, if you want to say that the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit who 
give us these gifts. Ephesians 4 has a similar passage talking about the unity of the body of Christ, but also the unity of Son, Lord, and God, Spirit, Lord, and God. And then, if, if any of you have been baptized, you have been baptized into what? Into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, you know what's interesting? And I just, it just dawned on me when I was reading these books. They pointed it out. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you're baptized into the name, singular, of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Isn't that interesting? Not accidental. Interesting. God is one. First uh, Deuteronomy 6 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. 1 Corinthians 12 says it's the same Spirit and the same Lord and the same God who give us these wonderful gifts to, to, to serve the church. Ephesians talks about it's the same thing. It's this one Spirit, this one Lord, and this one God who unite us together in the body of Christ. And in Matthew 28, we're all baptized into one name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, this was a real battle way back when in the early centuries. And if you will look on the back of your bulletin, you will see a portion of what's called the Athanasian Creed. Now, many of you have heard of Augustine or Augustine. Very well known. Great early church fathers, they call it. Not very many of us know about Athanasius. At 29 years of age, Athanasius argued this. <laughs> I'm 65 years of age. I wouldn't argue all this, although I agree with it. I'm not going to read this whole thing because this is only about a third of it. But I want you to read with, you can read quietly if you don't want to read out loud, but if you're willing, read out loud with me. It's on the back of your bulletins. Everybody got a bulletin? As you want. Notice the redundancy, but also the intentionality of what he's trying to say, okay? Read with me. Whoever wants to be saved should above all cling to the Catholic faith. Hold on a minute. I'm sorry. Catholic means global, little c, not big c. It means universal, global faith. Keep going. Whoever does not guard it whole and inviolable will doubtless perish eternally. Wow. Now, this is the Catholic faith. We worship one God in Trinity and the Trinity in unity, neither confusing the persons nor dividing the divine being. For the Father is one person, the Son is another, and the Spirit still another. But the deity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is one, equal in glory, co-eternal in majesty. What the Father is, the Son is, and so is the Holy Spirit. Uncreated is the Father, uncreated is the Son, uncreated is the Spirit. The Father is infinite, the Son is infinite, the Holy Spirit is infinite. Eternal is the Father, eternal is the Son, eternal is the Spirit, and yet there are not three eternal beings, but one who is eternal, as there are not three cre uncreated and unlimited beings, but one who is uncreated and unlimited, period. Let's stop there and go all the way down. This goes on for like quite a few more lines. Read the last line with me in bold. And right above it, you'll see, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, There's many more lines. Read this with me. One cannot be saved without believing this firmly and faithfully. This was kind of the period at the end of the sentence regarding the heresies that were being taught at the time, that there were either three modes of God or three separate gods, or that Jesus was not a real God, he was just adopted, so to speak, and anointed specially by God. If anybody wants 
the whole creed. I've got two copies with me. Be glad to give you a copy with me. God is three distinct persons, each fully God and yet one. And it's important that we believe it because of all of the ramifications, all of the impact and importance it has on what we say we believe. And it really centers around Jesus Christ and then the abiding of the Spirit within us. I think it's fairly easy for us to believe in God, the Creator God, God Almighty. There's something in us that realizes there's something other than ourselves, correct? Correct? And yet, how does He work? And I won't get in all the details of what some of these guys said, but God apparently is really kind of like overseeing God the Father, the Lord. And the Son, while co-equal, submitted himself. Philippians 2, he did not consider equality with God something to be clinged to, but he emptied himself. He stepped away from heaven for a, a time, stepped into time, took on flesh, and was willing to suffer and die for us. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. And the Holy Spirit then, after death and resurrection, was sent at God's direction to be with us. Three different people. Yes, three different roles. But one. Fully God. Every one of them. A little bit of application here as we close. What does this imply for us? There, is, there are some parallels as far as the implication and application. For example, when a husband and wife get married, what does the Bible say? You become one. Two distinct persons, yet spiritually somehow one. Don't get too caught up in that. That's a poor parallel, okay? However, there is a sense of two and one, correct? Now, just as the Father seems to be in charge, but the equal Son submits himself to the Father, so the wife, equal, submits herself to the husband. Isn't that an interesting parallel? I may be losing you guys, but that's all right. One more illustration. And we'll try to move to the close. The church. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, which we read, same Lord, same Spirit, same God, gifts us all. We are one body, local and, to use Athanasian's term, Catholic, local and global. Little C, big C, church, if I can say that. But we all are distinct and we all have different gifts. But we work best when the body works together. And so there's a distinctiveness in each of us, but a unity that is brought together by the Spirit. Now, I did have a question on the Trinity. Help me understand the Trinity. I don't know if that helped you understand the Trinity or not, but it helped me. <laughs> If you want my notes, I'll be glad to send them to you. <laughs> if you want to read my systematic theology book on this section, it's only about 50 pages, uh, one of them. Uh, I'll be glad to let you borrow it. But the implication is important and eternal. While we may not fully be able to understand it without going beyond our limited mental capacities, we cannot ignore it because God loved us enough to send his son to die for us and, as and for whoever believes. And as long as we are here, we are um, recipients of the Holy Spirit within us. It's all at once, but it's also all different. Okay? Let's bow in a word of prayer. Wow, Father. Mm deep, challenging things to try to understand. 
I pray, Holy Father, that far beyond the words that I shared today, you would open our minds up to understand at least a little bit of what it means that you are three in one. Distinct, equal, and eternal one. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. As we close today, give you an opportunity to, to pray, pray with me, talk with me if you'd like. But let's stand and sing together. Glorify thy name. This is actually uh, hymn number nine. There you go. And singers and Andrew thanks for playing and trying to lead us on um, didn't have much time to practice but they did a great job let's let's thank them again we uh, we I don't have a mouse in my pocket they prepared some music that they were gonna sing tonight uh, but they're going to postpone that part of this service tonight, the, the song service tonight, to, uh, to be able to do it when all of you can be together and Shelly can be a part of it um, because how she plays and leads will, will make it that much better. But we will have the service tonight. We will have as many of the hymns that were requested as we possibly can. Um, uh, some, most of them are in the hymnal, but not all. So we may not do those this time around. When, when, when Shelly comes back, um, hopefully we'll have that. Come and sing. Come and join us for the ice cream. Folks, I think we have 13 or 14 different churns of ice cream, and there's at least 10 different flavors, if I remember correctly. Yum. Eric's smiling at me. So are all of you. Yeah, about 10 different flavors of ice cream. How exciting that'll be. A couple of peaches, a couple of strawberries and vanillas, but I think all the rest are pretty much different. We'll see tonight. Come and taste it for yourself. Come and enjoy the fellowship. Come and enjoy the great music. Let us bow in a word of prayer as we prepare to leave. Father in heaven, thank you for your grace and your goodness and your generosity to us. Thank you that we don't have to understand everything, but that you're good enough to love us, send Jesus to die for us. Help us go and share what we do know 
with those who are lost and dying without Jesus. We pray these things in your name and for your glory and kingdom. Amen.